And now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. Hi there. Welcome to Rob at Home. I'm Rob Stewart, and it is great to be with you this half hour on your PBS station, KVIE. It is such a pleasure to talk about human beings helping others being human. And our guest for this half hour is someone who spends his life every day doing just that. Joshua Culver is the Director of Behavioral Health at SNAC, which is the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And he joins us right now from downtown Sacramento. Good to see you. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for carving out the time to make this happen. I so appreciate you being here. We are going to jump in deep. Uh, first, SNAC, which is the acronym for where you work, um, is a gift from the Native American community to the community at large. Is that right? That's correct. What are you seeing and who do you see as clients and what are you seeing and hearing right now? This organization is a medical home and it's holistic. So we treat the whole individual here. We have medical care, behavioral health care, dental, psychiatric care, chiropractic, ophthalmology, it's a one-stop shop. And we want to take care of the entire community, not just our native population. Right now is an interesting time. You have so many things going on socially in the community between the murder of George Floyd, um, social unrest with the police and what's happening with that, due process with the law, the global pandemic with COVID-19, and behind the scenes what's happening with that is that so many systems have been impacted that people depend upon for their own health and well-being and to move through the system to get resources that they need. This could be working with um, housing agencies, um, government agencies, social security, all of that has been waylaid or blocked in some capacity. Layer on that the trauma of what's happening for people. So our community is being impacted on multiple levels. That's You're right. seeing the effects of what we've seen happening for generations, but you're seeing it in real time right now, the effects of it in real time. You know, when you look at the history of America, it's a dark history in many ways. And through it, you have had people championing for their rights. And right now with the tension being so high in the community with a pandemic, and then what happened with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Stephon Clark, these are all the recent people that we know about, and there are probably people that we don't know about. This activates people, and it highlights pain, and it helps us move through the avoidance of pain into social change. Let me ask you something. You know, there is, from many accounts, something very different about this time. George Floyd, uh, my guest a few weeks ago said, the cameras were rolling. We saw a man killed on television. It is not at all anything new for people who are used to dealing with that in their community and I interviewed someone also who said every night when she goes to bed, this was Cassandra Pye, that she worries that her four sons, one of them could be next, or anyone that she loves who is black. As a behavioral health expert, how do you even begin to tap into that level of trauma when the world does not feel safe to you? And I think you really hit the nail on the head with that. The world does not feel safe for many people. I think that in America, we're looking at a culture in some ways of mass distraction and comfort where people don't want to be bothered with these issues if they don't have to be. But when you are in behavioral health, you see it with your clients, you see it within the people, you see it in their eyes and you hear it in their stories. And it's not just going to be a murder. There are microaggressions. There are different levels of institutional racism that all brown and black people or anybody who's a minority with a voice might face in this country. And so I think being more than 
an ally to people, being somebody who stands with them, who will not back down and who continues to learn and learn about their individual stories, people will open up and people can begin what might be a healing process, one would hope, to regain a sense of stability and safety in the world. And that would be trauma work. You're doing a lot of work through layers and layers of trauma with people. Can you, can you, Josh, get therapeutically to a level of trauma so deep? Can you intervene in that to where there is hope? First of all, a lot has to change for the hope to be reality, right? But with that said, can you penetrate such depths of trauma into a space of healing in here and in here for someone? I think many people want to heal and recover. Your health is your greatest asset. And as a therapist, my core values are really prioritizing people's health, their safety, and their wellness. That is my mission. And when you work with trauma and you're working with somebody who has experienced institutional racism or direct racism or a system that was broken and never served them the way it was supposed to serve them, you're working through a lot with somebody and really it's about helping them understand their story, their journey, how to integrate their past and their trauma and to make meaning from what they have been through in their life. And a lot of people want to recover. They want someone to take them through that journey in an effective way. And it's really where the client takes it. Um, as a white provider, when I'm working with somebody who's African American or Native American, I, they are the guide in many ways on what they feel safe to share. And we will address the fact that I'm a white provider and that there are differences. And I think that that dialogue, that frankness, that honesty helps build trust. And that is also kind of a key to open the door to helping people work with you and recover. And to answer your question, people can absolutely integrate trauma and work through it. And more often than not, they turn out to be these very wise, strong individuals who have a powerful story and life lessons that other people don't have. It comes with a certain depth. Another thing I want to say is that I was listening to T.G. Jakes and Mr. Jakes said that you don't have to be a victim of rape to speak out against being raped. You don't have to be a victim of being molested to speak out against uh, abuse. Um, and you see where I'm going with that. I think in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, and I may not be quoting him exactly right, but he said, you will not remember the, the words of your enemies. You'll remember the people that didn't speak up. The people that didn't really take a stance on the position. And yes, we are white. But I know where I stand. I know where my values are. And I know injustice and unfairness when I see it. And I'll do what I can to be an agent of change for that. And it's more than just being a, a you know, what we would call an ally. It's, it's our CEO, Britta Guerrero here at Snack would say, be an accomplice, which I, I really love that because you have to be in it. You have to take a stance. You have to make a hard decision and say, you know, if you can't move forward, I won't move forward. I'll stay with you. You mentioned the Dr. King quote that we are remembered not by our actions, but by our silence in certain, many certain ways. So what would your non-silence be? What would you say right now? That I think we're seeing a lot happening in the community at this time with the murder of George Floyd and that many people who have been marginalized and disenfranchised are speaking out. And I love that. I love the exposure. I love the honesty. I'm grateful that people have cameras and can catch what they need to catch and expose what should be exposed. And I think keeping the dialogue open that when people come together, regardless of race, race ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, when they come together, healing happens and people can make change. Yes, so I, I, healing is a we process. Absolutely, and that's where trust and healing sits. That is the chair of it. Can you give me an example of how you see systemic racism present itself 
and one client. Discuss to me, uh, hypothetically, not, not using their name, but a, a client who is black, where you have seen the examples of systemic racism. I think this is important to point out. Yeah. I have an African-American client who has really struggled in her life. She has had caregivers who did not look out for her, possibly because our healthcare system isn't designed or helping people of color the way it needs to. The statistics show that any black or brown person is marginalized in the healthcare system. They don't get that major resource and your health is your greatest asset. So when you look at the family system, the family structure that isn't helped, and then you get children within there, and the best predictor for a child's outcome is how strong that relationship is with the caregiver and the caregiver's response. So this client I'm talking about, you know, grew up in a family system that didn't have the resources it necessarily needed. And as an adult, you know, she recently um, was the victim of a crime, a shooting. The police did nothing. They came, they took a report. She was profiled. They didn't help her. They didn't investigate. She was then evicted, even though right now people are not supposed to be evicted, but they said, you can either leave or you're evicted, which to me is an eviction. You're not given that choice. Nobody who is impoverished and struggling financially wants an eviction on their record. You will never get housing again within this system. And now she's living out of her car and has had to relocate her family with extended family and she's on her own and was just in a car accident and has very limited means. And this is an incredibly intelligent woman. And so when we talk about systemic things that don't work, it only takes one wrong step in that or one misjustice to dramatically impact a person's life. And that's just one person. And people are profiled and, you know, not all racism or bigotry or unconscious biases are really flashy. You know, oftentimes they're microaggressions, but they can make a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Microaggressions can be the foundation of um, a bully that is not seen, but that is all around. Well, and when you have enough bad things happening, an embrittlement process happens with a person. Most people have a certain amount of resiliency and they can't tolerate. You know, some people are very strong and somehow champion through, but many people, it doesn't take much to, to break you down. And I've got to give it to the African-American community because that is a powerful, strong community. And they have been able to adapt to incredibly difficult situations and circumstances in America, along with the Native people. You know, here at SNAC, our, our motto you'll see in our window is Native sovereignty and Black liberation. That's a beautiful, beautiful statement. I think it tells us a very clear, concise story that in America, there are many people that comprise this country and they all have a story about what has happened. We are seeing right now tremendous rise in the number of new infections of COVID-19. Hmm. And we are returning to normal, so to speak, trying to. And we are also seeing more infections than we saw at the height of the beginning of this. How does that play psychologically? For people? Mm -hmm. It is so impacting on every level of life. So people are afraid. People have not done well with the disorganization that has come from this. People have not done well with the change in routine in structure, particularly adolescents who have um, sort of lost a sense of identity through this, where they're not able to go to school. They're not necessarily getting their grades. They might not be graduating. They can't hang out with their friends, which is so important to them. And sort of a loss of a sense of self. And children will respond in many ways, depending on how their parents are responding. And they're seeing job loss with their parents. They're seeing layoffs. They're seeing furloughs. They're seeing parents not really sure what the outcome is going to be. They're seeing parents who get sick with this. And it's terrifying. So it's been very hard. And um, it's had far-reaching impacts in the community, particularly for people who have already been traumatized or people that may have much less than other people. 
Yeah, especially when that, the, the trauma is already there on top of systemic um, racism and then intergenerational trauma, which is what I'd like to talk about next is, is the generation after generation after generation of trauma and the impact it has there have been some really interesting um, studies done on the impact of intergenerational trauma, epigenetic coding, how this has impacted people's makeup, and that maybe more than just genes are passed through our genes. You know, we talk about traumatic memories or experiences or just never feeling safe. When you look at the Holocaust survivors, people that went through that, people who are refugees, People, and we do have a lot of refugees here, particularly in Sacramento, that have gone through generations of trauma. And um, there are many um, articles out there that you can find uh, that are available you know, through the internet that are reputable, that have been peer reviewed, that will talk about how the impact of intergenerational trauma is far reaching. It has a, a long reach and it impacts people on deep levels and it requires like, well, I wanna come back to the healthcare equity those people need a different kind of box to stand on in order to heal and recover, which I believe is a person's right to be able to heal and recover in an appropriate way, in a healthful and helping way. Are you seeing this come to a, a boil or, or a massive breaking point? I think people are struggling. I wouldn't say a boil. Most people are very strong and can cope and they're stronger than they may even know. There's a fortitude within people and it's, it's beautiful to see it, but also I am seeing people really struggling with the complete rupture in structure mm -hmm. more than anything with their identity. Um, people that are not working or having to work from home and it's when people have other issues that this becomes even harder to bear. So let's say you have an anxiety condition or OCD or depression or chronic pain, which is in its own way debilitating, and you add this on top of it, it can be very difficult. And if you increase family stress in an already stressed family system, it can be very detrimental. And I, I wouldn't say a boiling point, but I think people are having a difficult time coping. Yeah. I think they are too, I think everybody is. And I, I, I think that um, people are desperate right now for hope. People well, are searching for, um, I heard several people last week say, and this is a quote, they are looking for a moral leader. Yes, I think during times of uncertainty and right now when you're when your justice system might not be taking the action or isn't taking the action that people really need to right the ship it and you have a global pandemic people are dying the whole world feels unsafe i've had clients say i kind of feel like the world is ending which is a catastrophic because humanity survives i mean we've shown that but it's scary when you don't have the leadership that you that people know in their hearts there's an integrity that needs to come with it with being a leader and some direction maybe a word of solace or comfort which i don't think america has really had so then i ask you because we're both sitting here what would you say to offer solace and comfort i think Naturally, people do not like pain and we avoid it instinctively. You touch a hot stove, you're gonna pull your hand back. Mm -hmm. Maybe even more so for emotional pain. So some people don't wanna watch the death of George Floyd. Maybe it's uncomfortable for them to even see the truth about what's happened to any person who's different than themselves. And it's uncomfortable to look at that. I would say people, can cope with pain very well and to look at it, to address it, to get the help you need, to work with the pain. But when people have pain and they avoid it, they suffer and it can be very difficult. So I would say as a word of comfort that of course we are going to get through this. Humanity persists. We will find a way through this. We will adapt and we will overcome. And my hope is that through the death, the murder of George Floyd through COVID, we learned some really valuable lessons about our humanity. 
and make some change. But that will not happen without decisive action and people speaking up. And decisive action and people speaking up, I have learned, comes from walking into the uncomfortable. You yourself um, were exposed at an early age to what happens when humanity doesn't take care of its fellow person. Right. So um, when you were a child. Yes. So when I was about six years old, my father was an Air Force uh, major in the Air Force, and my mom was a teacher. And we were stationed over in Germany. And my mom has long been a champion of civil rights, human rights. She's a very educated woman and made it her business to show me and my little brother at the time the history in Europe that was there. And part of that was going to learn about the Holocaust and going to the death camps. We've been to Dachau and saw what can happen. And my mom was I think criticized by a couple of her friends that you shouldn't expose kids to that. And my mom's position was my children will know the truth. They will see. And that's part of that education and being willing to look in the mirror at what humanity can do. What, and that was only what, 75 years ago, 74 years ago that the war ended. And in 1979, we had our last segregated school in America. That's, 40 years ago. So this is right on our coattails and that dialogue needs to be fierce in order to continue to jockey for change in society and increase our human capital to a new level where there's more understanding, compassion and kindness and healing, which I think we're feeling now more than ever. So if you talk about a boil, that might be it, you know, that people are becoming more, uh, you'll, you know, woke air quotes <laughs> through this process and it can be really beautiful. You also had something else very traumatic happen to you when you were 13, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you could have died. Yeah. Um, when I was 13, I was hit by a car going about 50 miles an hour. And I was, a, I was just walking a pedestrian. And the, the accident was uh, pretty bad. And so when you look at the definition of trauma, um, it's really when an event threatens your deepest integrity as a person. And that could be, a, you know, anywhere from a, a mugging to a dog attack to being exploited deeply at work or the government even. That's so good. Say that again. Trauma is... Trauma is when an event threatens your deepest integrity as a person. Wow. That is a, that's a phenomenal definition. That is the root of it. And there are many different types of trauma like we've talked about. Um, there is some evidence that the worst type of trauma are those that are willfully inflicted by the hands of another. So where somebody's violent aggression of their will was weaponized and you were used for the expression of that. And that is the most damaging to people's integrity. That would be rape, murder, molestation, um, exploitation, trafficking, and that my trauma was a physical accident. So I didn't have the willful action of another against me, but my recovery was very long. And it was at a time where people weren't really talking so much about mental health. Um, you know, there's a healthy dialogue about it now in the community, which I love. But back then I went through this sort of privately, you know, through depression, through symptoms of PTSD. And, um, that recovery was long, but I think it called me to a different kind of um, purpose, if you want to call it that, to be of help to other people. What are some of the wisest words that you have heard um, in your life that have stuck with you, that have stayed in your, in your soul? Um, maybe not through education um, in the traditional sense, but sure. through love or through people. You know, my, my best friend is a um, Russian, Ukrainian, Jewish refugee that came to America fleeing religious persecution. And she's a genius and she became a psychologist and she helps people too. And one thing she said to me once, you know, pulls from Buddhist psychology is that what you feed grows. And it's very simple, but it is so true about what you want to focus on in life and that we get this one life to do good work and to be kind 
hopefully, and make a difference. And to own your truth, your own individual truth. And I love the opposite of that. And that is, if you don't want it to grow, don't feed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so what do you want to do? How do you want to be? And I think that when there are global pandemics, when there is, you know, racial injustice, no due process with the law or corrupt process with the law, it calls people to that. Like, what do you want to do? And how can you speak up? Josh Culver, thank you so much. What an enlightening half hour. Uh, I could talk to you for quite a long time. If that's what you do, you are a, a, <laughs> a therapist with behavioral health and the director of that at the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And I see why you are. It is a pleasure speaking with you, Josh. Thank you for all of your time today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, we will see you next week right here on Bob at Home. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.